This week in Pure Reinvention. Detroit is big enough to matter in the world, but small enough where you can matter in it. Certainly Pure Reinvention is what's happening in Detroit. Episode 46, Jeanette Pierce, Executive Director, Detroit Experience Factory. Engage. Disrupt. Adapt. Repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Welcome to this edition of Pure Reinvention, where our mission is to create space for the unexpected by inspiring a reinvention lifestyle. Hi, Misty. Hello, Mike. It is a great interview we did this week. It's an exciting one because I I warned you I was going to take the credit for this, so I'm just going to get it out of you the did. way right now. I've been asking you to, to talk to Jeanette and get her in for a podcast for a long time. Well, meet with her for years. I've been saying, hey, we need to find out more about this Detroit Experience Factory. And for good reason. Aren't you glad now that you guys have a relationship? Well, I've had a chance to know Jeanette for a period of time. I didn't maybe tell you all of that. And uh, Jeanette has – what's really inspired me about Jeanette's work is she had a passion for Detroit. And she was able to turn that passion into something that she recognized other people would be interested in. And now they stay very busy teaching people and sharing with people the story of Detroit. Misty, another thing I want to share with our listeners is the We Invent opportunity and experience that's coming up very quickly that the Peer Reinvention team has been working on. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, we've been uh, working closely with Jeanette because she's going to be part of it and help us kind of design it around a field trip experience for the women we're taking to Detroit uh, October 23rd. Uh, we're really looking forward to it just because it's going to be a great opportunity for women leaders and and not necessarily executives. You know, you can be a leader in any position in your in your job, in your life, and how they can learn from the entrepreneurs that are in Detroit. We really appreciated Jeanette's uh, assistance with that. With her help, this is going to be a very special day. And, and Misty, we hope to make this a really regular thing where we're able to expose people to a lot of the unique things that are in Detroit with Jeanette's help. Yeah, if you're interested in the We Invent project right now, you can uh, register online at weinvent.com. 2015.eventbrite.com or email us at hello at peerreinvention.com and we can give you some more details. Let's listen to this great interview and we'll see you on the other side. We're really excited today to be with Jeanette Pierce, Executive Director of the Detroit Experience Factory, well known as the local expert in all things Detroit. Welcome, Jeanette. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, Jeanette, here's the number one question I've been wanting to ask for a long time. Mm -hmm. Why do you have such a passion about Detroit? Gosh, uh, I mean, you know, it's it certainly started young. Um, I, I am a lifelong Detroiter, so I have lived in the city proper um, the whole my whole life. I, I have to be specific about that because I say Detroit and people say, where? Like Clarkston? And I say, yeah. no, like actually the Real city Detroit. limits. Um, um, so grew up in the city. Uh, studied abroad, but I mean, you know, the whole, my whole life, people would say, Oh, you live in Detroit. Oh my God. And I'd have to be like, well, actually I live in a great neighborhood. We know our neighbors and, uh, we have a great house and I, and I'm safe and all of those things. And I, but then I'd say, come see it. Let right. me show you Detroit, you know, show you the Detroit my I Detroit. know by living here. And then you can tell me. Uh, so that was kind of always there. My parents were very involved in, in the city and, and were certainly passionate about it. Um, but really it wasn't, uh, until I moved downtown after college, um, which was 12 and a half years ago, April of 2003. And I haven't driven to work since. And I, and by not driving, I actually started seeing things. I like to say that I had always loved Detroit. But when I moved downtown and, and I kind of fell in love with Detroit. Um, so you're kind of one of those, because is it fair to say one of those millennials who fell in love with Detroit, did not need a car, wanted to really connect with the city that you are living in? Uh, yes. No, I'm, I'm on the cusp. Oh, okay. Of you're the a tweener. Which is great. I'm actually, because I came before a lot of the, um, you know, I'm very much an early adopter of that sense. But yes, a lot of the things that um, you hear millennia, about millennials now uh, certainly uh, apply to me. Um, I didn't, you know, I studied abroad and I was like, wow, this walking thing, that's that's pretty cool. So I want Spain, but I want it in Detroit. And people laughed at me. But I did. I haven't driven to work. I walked to bars. I walk, I wanted that uh, that lifestyle. Um, I didn't want to own a house. I didn't want to get married at 25. I didn't, you know, so all of those are things that, that they do um, kind of ascribe to millennials. And you're not alone in those things you just listed off as what I want, are you? No, absolutely not. I mean, you have um, the, the three... 
um, major points that I don't know if it, they actually call it that, but like basically make you a grown up, right? Is um, buying a house, getting married, and having kids. And mm-hmm. millennials are doing all of those things much later, and certainly not necessarily in, in those order in mm-hmm. that order. Um, but I still, you know, I do remember pre internet, and I do not. I didn't have a cell phone in high school, so. But I think that actually helps. I can bridge kind of between the old and the new, and I can also do that with Detroit as a whole because I have lived here my whole life. And, but I also, you know, frequently work with people that are, are coming to the city now, but also people who have lived here their whole life as well. So I like to be that bridge. So Jeanette, where did the idea for the Detroit Experience Factory come from? Uh, the idea came from my own uh, amazement when I, cause I knew Detroit. Gosh darn it, I grew up in the city and I knew Detroit and I had been telling people about it and I was hanging out at Blues Bars when I was 18 and I was, you know, really involved. We weren't, we didn't just live here. We were very engaged in the city. And so I had this assumption of knowledge and I, and certainly what I knew was great. Um, but it wasn't until I started walking around going, what's that building? Stopping and talking to the owner of a bar or restaurant. Oh, how long have you been here? 60 years? How come I didn't know that? And every time I learned something new, I just loved being here more. I loved my city more. Uh, and my quality of life, you know, just got better and better and got excited about things. And I wanted to share those things with other people. And honestly, my friends were like, shut up already. Uh, so they were kind of sick of hearing about it. Yeah. And I, I, I realized that there are other people who did want to know about this. And that it, not only that, that it could be helpful, that, that there was so much misinformation, so much partial truths and negative perceptions um, that it was really having a, a negative effect on not just our city, but our region and honestly our state as a, as a whole. So if people had a negative perception in one fashion or another for whatever reason, you had to, you had to be able to tell the truth. But for you to tell the truth, you had to know. So you must have some sort of very natural curiosity about this city that you live in. I mean, yeah. like, a, like a never-ending curiosity. Yeah, the more I learn, the more I learn I don't know. I had a professor in college say that once, and it's, and it's very true. Um, I, I'm constantly wanting to learn. Uh, as much as I do know about Detroit, which is um, quite a bit, I'm still learning stuff every day, whether it's new things that are, are opening or new, new facts that are happening or, again, old things that you might just not have come across. Um, because the, the, that's the thing is a lot of Detroit – Detroit stories and people and places and projects, um, you know, weren't on the front cover of the newspaper, didn't have billboards or huge marketing budgets, uh, but they were really wonderful. But you had to, you had to dig a little deeper to find out about them. But then it was worth it because the quality of, of what you were finding, uh, was so great. How did you start to connect the dots to realize there was a real opportunity to nurture this idea called the Detroit Experience Factory? Um, I met a friend in a bar. Uh, you know, like a lot of things, uh, like that. So we, we started talking, um, we thought, you know, I'd been thinking about it. Uh, she was, um, recently divorced and realized that she didn't know anything about her own city. Uh, we started working together and, uh, we launched just in time for Super Bowl, um, in 2006. Uh, like a lot of things, it wasn't the reason we launched, but it gave us a deadline. Sure. Uh, so some people will ask me, well, all this stuff happened because of Super Bowl. And my answer is no, it's more just like when you're having a party, you make sure your, you know, that bathroom renovation project gets finished or, right. you know, you get, you clean the house. So, yep. uh, just gave us that deadline. Um, and really, you know, one of our original concepts was friend for rent, <laughs> uh, because we'd like, you know, when we go to the bar, when we go to the restaurant, you get a hug from the owner and a free shot, you know, that that's pretty cool. Uh, but we were two single ladies. So we thought friend for rent wasn't pro- probably that good of a name, um, or could maybe right. be misconstrued. Uh, Misunderstood just a little bit. Uh, so, so we actually, our original name, uh, was inside Detroit. Okay. And that was, uh, you know, we didn't have a branding exercise or anything. You know, we probably talked about it for a few minutes and, um, and but that idea that we wanted to give people the insider's perspective on Detroit, right? Which um, is really the truth, right? Right. Well, it's the it's the truth by you know there's truth, but with facts and figures, which we absolutely know. Um, but also the the experience, the firsthand oh, knowledge, right? Because yeah. certainly you know there's the you know our crime rate, for example, is one of the questions we get asked about a lot, and um, and so it is true that we have a high crime rate. Um, however, um, as a person who lives in the city, 
Um, I feel very safe. And I've lived in the city my whole life. I went to Spain, as I mentioned, I'd only been there six days and I got mugged. You know, so so things happen. But for the most part, if you're not looking for trouble, trouble's not looking for you. Right. And a lot of times the crime is is people who know each other and 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 are fighting amongst each other or it's drug related. Um and and it's actually getting better. And I, and downtown has less crime than the national average on that on that too. So mm-hmm. so again, it's a combination, it's the one two punch of of correct facts and understanding them. Uh, as well as followed by the personal experience. So you felt very compelled to connect people with with what your experiences were and have them experience it. Thus, I, I mean, obviously, that must be where the Detroit experience factory came from, was we got to give people that direct experience. Absolutely. The experiences are so powerful. I mean, as we all know, you can hear about something, you can read about something, you can see something on TV, uh, but experiencing something really has a lasting and more profound impact. And, uh, and I can explain it to you and, you know, and I'm pretty good at explaining things and getting, and getting people to see it through my eyes, through explanation, but getting people out and meeting that person and hearing that story and being in that place and, and, uh, and feeling the passion of the people that they're meeting, uh, you, you can't Google that. Um, I mean, we do a lot of tours. I mean, so I don't know if the listeners are familiar, but you know, that's our main uh, program, our tours. But you know, if you think Detroit gets a bad reputation, tours get a bad reputation, uh, right? Sure. I mean, people think double decker buses and want, 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 want kind of tour guides. And that's just not what we do, which is uh, why we really wanted to use that term experience. Um, and we also help people whether they come on a tour, which we've taken over 50,000 people. Uh, since we started That's on phenomenal. these experiences and mostly locals. That's another, p- or, or people that live in the state or have a longer contact, uh, longer contact with Detroit because, and we don't mind helping tourists and we don't turn them away. We like it, but we want to, we're a nonprofit and we want our, imp- it to be impactful. And when locals can learn this information, they can use it. Um, where a tourist goes away two days later and, uh, and might not be able to go back to that shop or that restaurant. Or most importantly, locals can learn, um, and understand the issues that are happening, uh, in their region and maybe be more apt to, to want to be part of the solution. And that's a really big part of what we do. So you just alluded to something really interesting, which is when people come on these tours these and, and they participate in these experiences, they learn things. Can you talk about some of the the major experiences that people learn from and, the, and the, some of the big t- takeaways that you've seen people really um, have uh, connect with? Um, after having done these 50,000, uh, that's 50,000 people, right? 50,000 people. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be some really profound takeaways and, and lessons learned that you've seen over yeah, the years. Yeah. I mean, very, you know, a couple of the ones stuck out from really early on, even. For example, I had a doctor on a tour that we did and he really seemed to enjoy it. But then after the tour, this is a public tour. We mostly do private customized tours around all different types of themes, which mm-hmm. uh, we can talk about later, but public tour. And he's, and at the end of the, to where he says, Oh my God, I feel like such an idiot. And I'm like, what, what's wrong? Or, you know, I thought you like, he's like, I love the tour. He's like, I'm here at a conference and I was offered my dream job in Detroit two years ago. And I turned it down because I didn't want to live in Detroit. You know, like I'm not making this up for like marketing purposes. He said, if I had taken this tour when I was here doing that interview, I'd be living my dream job in a really cool place. And I'm just kicking myself now. Sure. And that's the impact that, you know, that's just part of it. I had another uh, young woman from University of Michigan who said afterwards, she was so bubbly afterwards. She was like, oh, my God, this was so great. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and she's like, you know, it never even occurred to me to stay in Michigan after I graduated. But now I want to live in Detroit. And I'm pre-law. And I have friends. If I bring them down, can you tell show them what you showed us? And maybe we can volunteer at a local nonprofit. And, you know, and, and so these, the power of... um a couple hours. This is also a really big part of it is that we have some really um, major issues in Detroit, in the state, in the country, right? I mean, a lot of Detroit's issues are not unique to Detroit, but we don't have the answers to them overnight. And if we, if we did, you can't do it overnight. The power of a couple hours, a half a day, uh, whatever time people have that we get to spend with people, the a power that it, it has to, to, to have a positive impact on their life, on 
the the city, the state, the region, like that domino effect of that mm-hmm. positive impact is huge. So with what you hear today from from the generation of individuals graduating from school now is they have to go somewhere else to find the kind of lifestyle they want. They have to go to Brooklyn, New York. They have to live in Manhattan. They have to be where the action is. Yet what I'm hearing you tell me is if I give you a couple of hours of time, you'll convince me that perhaps the action is right here in Detroit. Absolutely. And and even our value proposition um, is actually stronger than a lot of those uh, cities that you just mentioned. And it's just that a lot of people haven't, haven't thought about it that way. So, for example, you said the value proposition in Detroit is even maybe stronger than some of these others. Mm-hmm. Give me an example of what you mean by that. Well, so just to, you know, so yes, people are want to, students want, and college grads and millennials want to go to New York and Chicago and stuff, but more often they're even going to Portland. Uh, you know, they don't, New York, yes, but it's almost too big to some extent oh, for sure. a lot of people. Yeah. Also, really what they want are, are, is this walkability, are lots of bars and restaurants, is this place? And you'll hear people say, well, no, they want a job and that's what matters. Um, actually, that's not true. I mean, the studies and you know, multiple studies have actually shown that they frequently, um, or more often than not, young people choose a place they want to be, then they look for a job there. Mm, um, Portland is a great example, which is drawing people from all over and is actually one of the higher unemployment rates of any city in America. Um, and so, uh, place does matter. Um, and we actually have quite a few jobs here, both in the city and in the state that we have all these big city amenities, 150 bars and restaurants, the one square mile of downtown, three major sports stadiums. I mean, mo- other cities might have them, but they're very spread out and, and not very walkable. 13,000 theater seats is the second largest theater district in the entire country. Second only to New York, opera, Broadway, avant-garde, the whole spectrum. Campus Marshes Park, fourth best public square in North America. The river walk in Canada, for heaven's sakes. I mean, these are things that we kind of forget. It's an international border. Uh, we have people come from all over the world. Kyrgyzstan I just had, and China, and Germany, and you name it. None of those things are my favorite, though. Uh, my favorite thing about Detroit are the people and the sense of community we have, that we work together. We have a sense of collaboration. You'll have one bar help another bar open right next door. Uh, I, I gave my notes to new tour companies that are starting up. Uh, I mean, it's really, as I travel... You don't see it in other places because in the end of the day, we all want to be a part of something bigger and we want what's best for our city. Um, We're not martyrs. We're not trying to make a point or anything. I love my life here. Just, you know, that's why I'm here. But part of that is being connected to a bigger picture and being able to have a positive impact. So the one line that I always say when people say, why Detroit? It's that Detroit is big enough to matter in the world, but small enough where you can matter in it. And there's not another city on this planet that can say that. Well, that's really interesting because what you're beginning to help me understand is you don't have to go somewhere else to find what you already have here in your own backyard. Now, Detroit has gone through a lot of changes in the last 10 years. And some people have suggested at some point those changes will stop happening in such a dramatic pace. Do you agree with that? Or do you think Detroit is a city that will continually evolve with time? I think that we are just really at the beginning of, oh, of what's happening right sure. now. Um, oh, I don't even remember who it is, but there's somebody that likes to, uh, involved in the city that likes to ask people this question, what inning of a baseball game do you think we're in right now? You know, my response was, you know, maybe the third. Oh, really early in the game. Yeah. But b- between the second and third. Yeah. Um, and he said, that's, that's kind of what he's gotten from most people is like somewhere between two and second and fourth inning. The game's just forming then. It, we're, we're just getting started really. Um, I mean, this is, I, I like to use the analogy of, uh, popcorn. I, I like to use analogies, a lot of different analogies. Um, when I started, when I moved downtown in 2003, um, there was no, Compuware building. There was no campus march. So, but it was like one thing a year. And this is where the popcorn, it's like pop campus march, you know, Compuware. I don't know if you can hear the snaps, but I'm stepping. And then the next year, campus marshes. The next year, the YMCA. And it was like one, it was kind of this, like it was consistent, but it was kind of slow. And then it started to pick up a little bit. Right. And now it's like you right. can't even turn yeah. around and it's just. It's really, you know, it's oh my really God, that, oh that, oh that, oh that. But we're so far from saturation. And then we also have the whole rest of the city, um, which there's lots of great things going on in neighborhoods too. Um, the city itself isn't really focusing on downtown. It's mostly private investment. The city is focusing, focusing very much on all throughout the neighborhoods. And there's lots of great stuff going on in the neighborhoods and they they are getting a good amount of attention, but 
So there's great small businesses that have been around forever that are opening. Um, you have great, you have housing stock, you have bidding wars going on in some of these neighborhoods. You know, it's really, you know, and what people tell me who travel a lot, who really know and understand cities is that, you know, cause I can say why I like it, but what I say, I ask them what I had a friend right. who became friends with a travel letter from New York who got paid to travel 20 years. He worked there. And, and when he got vacation, he came to Detroit and it was his favorite city. And I said, what's David, tell me about that. And uh, he said, other cities, you know, you travel a lot. Cities start to blend together. It's the same shops, the same restaurants, the same streetscapes, the same vibe, the same feeling. Maybe they have different names. Maybe they don't. But they all just feel exactly the same. And Detroit doesn't. Detroit is not the same. And I think one of the silver linings for being late to the revitalization game, because we're certainly, I mean, make no bones about it. We are late. We are not. We're not early. We're not for like, that's a lot of times what I have to explain to people too. I mean, Washington, D.C., New York. I mean, Times Square in 1980 was prostitutes and drug dealers. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, you couldn't pay people to live around there um, in that time. We get to learn from some of the mistakes. um, And we get to not make ourselves like everybody else. But I, don't, I think Detroit has a interesting perspective of always wanting to invent themselves. So they're not necessarily willing to follow the template from, from what somebody else is doing. Yeah. I mean, we can learn from other cities absolutely, you know, what to do and what not to do in some cases. But um, we do, we certainly like to do things uh, our own way, I guess. So when, our, when, our, um, when we had a chance to collide and kind of learn from each other what we were doing, we immediately saw that there was an opportunity for us to work together in some of the projects that Pure Reinvention is doing. And we have this very cool event coming up October 23rd called We Invent, which is a women's only experience. And we've reached out to you to help us with that. Without uh, giving up too much of the detail, can you tell us what this experience will entail and why someone should be interested in participating? Yes. Uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've been really enjoying working, you know, with you and your team. Uh, and even as we got ready for the ASAE conference and certainly pure reinvention is what's happening in Detroit. And, and there's so many great examples of that. And we have had people uh, come from all around the country and locally to learn from Detroit, from the people, places and projects here uh, to see how we've done it outside of the box, which I know is kind of an overused term, but it's actually not, you know, without a box at all. <laughs> That's maybe a better way of saying it, right? Yes, exactly. Um, and so we've had Nike, we've had Converse, we've had Bosch International bring their executive teams here, and we've put innovation-themed uh, tours and experiences together. And it's been really, really successful. And we're really excited to then kind of have this focus of women innovators, women entrepreneurs, women, what I call doers. These are, you know, all around the city. There's people everywhere that can complain about stuff that just say, why don't we have this? They should do that. But in Detroit, people say, why don't we have this? Okay, I guess I'll do it. And uh, and certainly women are really, uh, in many ways, leading that charge. And so I'm really excited to, to, to bring a group here uh, to Detroit to meet some of these amazing women and learn uh, and be inspired by uh, the city of Detroit and, uh, and its amazing people. Jeanette, we really have appreciated the time that you have shared with us today. We want to thank you for the partnership that you have allowed us to create, and we look forward to more great things to come. Thank you. So, Misty, a couple of key takeaways that I want to spend a few minutes and talk to you about is uh, one is curiosity and two is storytelling. So let's talk, first of all, about curiosity. What What is it about a person when they're curious, like Jeanette is about Detroit, that's really just attractive. Well, I think Jeanette's the perfect example of it. It's that her curiosity has created a business. It's created a life for her and a career now and is helping other people in the city learn from that. But but what's so attractive about the the yeah, the curiosity is one of our favorite questions, which is what's next. Right. And that keeps it spinning and keeps it going and keeps the churn of ideas happening. They they don't all have to be good ideas. 
but it's that you can learn and grow from them. And if you're not curious, you're not going to be learning and growing. I think that's interesting that the curiosity factor suggests that the journey is is never ending. I think sometimes people think if I can just go through this reinvention process and then I'm done, I can stay wherever I end mm-hmm. up at. And the reality is that it's it's a journey that continues forever. And so you have to be constantly curious about the, the what's next question. Right. And I think the struggle is the, the, the sustainability part of that. It's keeping it going. And how do you stay excited about things? Jeanette has stayed excited about Detroit for a very long time because uh, I think things are constantly changing enough that there's new things to be curious about. But even the old things, the businesses that, that have been there 60 years that she just discovered, she couldn't believe that that had been in her backyard for 60 years. Misty, one of the things that I've admired that you've taught me is the importance of storytelling. And Jeanette seems to be a really good storyteller about what is happening in Detroit. And I know you feel very strongly about the role of storytelling in 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 selling the experience. Is that just a nice way of saying that I'm a talker? <laughs> well, I think it's a nice way of saying you can talk in a way in which people are pulled into the story. Yes. And they start yes. to own the story and they start to want to know what happens in the story and at the end of the story. And so they take some ownership of it. So I, I, I'm i um, very um, intrigued by how good storytellers get an audience mm-hmm. and, a, and, and a strong following. And Detroit is, t- is writing such a great story every day. And I think what's attractive about that is hearing the story, you get behind the why. And everyone's starting to learn, like um, companies like Apple and um, uh, other other companies are explaining that the why is so important. You People will buy into anything if they get the why. So do you think that's what Jeanette is doing then? Is she's able to tell the, the whole story or what led up to what she's showing people so people Absolutely. are really impressed with how we got to this particular thing we're looking at? Yeah, I do think that that's part of it. And it's a compelling story. That helps. It really helps to have good material. Yeah, so you're not just taking people and showing them different things in Detroit and saying, there it is. You're telling the whole how we got here, what's going to happen next, how it connects, Mm -hmm. the dots. And she's had a lot of excitement. She shared a couple of stories, which were really fantastic stories in this interview about people that didn't know, locals that didn't know what they had. And she is opening their eyes in a magnificent way just by telling the story. So if you're able to tell the story, and then here's another thing that Jeanette talked about, which was connecting the dots. And you, the other day, even before this interview, were talking to me about how we've got to kind of connect the dots, that it's very important that people learn how to connect the dots. Now Jeanette's talking about connect the dots. So let's talk for a minute about this thing called connect the dots. <laughs> well, <laughs> we um, we talked about connect the dots and we also talked about collecting the dots. Oh, yeah, that's right. And remember that? Yeah. And I think that's just a fun part of making the connections is collecting enough dots that you can make connections too. And that comes with being curious and telling the story and learning more about the story. And then you all of a sudden you have all of these dots. And at first it's like, okay, I know this and then this part and then that part. And then these things emerge. The more dots you collect, the the more you're able to connect them and see new ways to to make a meaningful change. And and that goes back to our, you know, fundamental and reinvention, which is connect. Yeah, step number four. Yep. A very key part of what are we going to do with all these things is how do we connect or reconnect them in a in a way in which we continue to always have value. And so in, De- in Detroit, Jeanette is helping people collect more dots about Detroit. And the magnificent thing is once you go there and learn about all those dots, you can connect them. You can connect them to your life. Um, what's really exciting about bringing the women there, uh, we, we kind of arrived at this aha moment naturally, was that Detroit has all these myths about it. And I think mm-hmm. women feel like there's a lot of myths about women in leadership and, and women in, in these stronger roles. Mm-hmm. And boy, can't we learn something from the city of Detroit in that way that – we don't have to play into whatever you think the story is. Let's write our own story. Well, and it seems like in today's world, it's ripe for writing your own story. It's The world is not behaving in the traditional way that it has been in the past. So if the world is truly open to writing your own story, then it's an opportunity that everyone has. In this particular case, you're talking about our We Invent experience, but it's an opportunity that everybody has to write their own story and Absolutely. connect your own dots. And if you need to collect your own dots before you can can, can connect your dots. It's a tongue twister, but it's fun. It is. I had to it. think about it twice and really work hard at it. It's 
it ties in the curiosity. It ties in the key assets that you have by the dots. It It is just a marvelous way to see step four in action. And I hope that this interview got people excited about Detroit. And, and coming to Peer Reinvention, we want to be able to bring you, we want to connect you to not only Jeanette, but to Detroit's story and let you make your own decisions and connect your own dots so your own story can emerge. There is going to be more about what we're doing in Detroit, isn't there? There Misty? is. So, um, yeah, maybe this should be our little teaser about that. We have another program coming up in November called Starters, and there is um, a lot to talk about. So that's your teaser. That's it, what it's called. Stay tuned for more. You're going to have to listen to the next podcast. As Misty, you would stay, stay connected. <laughs> that's right. Well, Mike, this has been fun. We learned a lot from Jeanette. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Remember, if you are ready for a change, make it a change that lasts. Make it pure reinvention. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at pureinvention.com.